Our second lesson comes from John chapter 3. Oh, but I want to read it from down here. Before I read you this passage, I want you to kind of reset your brain and try and listen to this story with new ears. You have heard parts of this passage many times before. Uh, You've probably had well-intentioned people on street corners or in restaurants approach you and ask you, are you born again? That's one understanding of this passage, and it colors how we hear it. You've also seen bumper stickers that simply say, John 316. Or maybe you've seen the poster board signs, for God so loved the world, that people hold up at baseball games and football games. Again, very well-intentioned people. But it changes how you hear this passage. So whatever your experience with this story is, try to set that aside and listen with fresh ears and see what you hear. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, Moses led God's people out of slavery and into the wilderness. It's not the place that Moses had planned on stopping, 
the promised land sounded so much more appealing. But the people were whiny and needy and prone to worshiping idols and complaining against God. They needed some time in the wilderness to learn some lessons. And boy, did they get their opportunity. Here's the story from Numbers chapter 21 about when they're wandering in the wilderness. You'll recognize this part about the serpent that was in what I just read. The people became impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The Israelites knew better than to be whiny and needy. They knew they shouldn't worship idols and complain about God, but they did it anyway. And then they were punished for their actions, and they were ashamed. Or, well, at least they should have been ashamed. They knew better. They believed their punishment was being surrounded by poisonous serpents in the wilderness with food they didn't like, and the fear of going without water. And people were dying. But Moses loved them and prayed to God to spare the people. And that cure came in a very strange way. Moses made a snake and put it on a pole and held it up high for them to look at. And that would heal them. Or we could say it this way, the people had to face their shame in order to be healed. Remember, God's people have a long history with serpents. It was the crafty snake in the garden that led those earthlings to eat fruit from the one place they weren't supposed to eat fruit. They don't feel good about snakes looking at a statue of something that bit them long ago at creation and just bit them on the heel, something they'd rather not have to face. Nicodemus came prowling up to Jesus in the dark of the night professing with words that he believed that Jesus must be from God. But his actions didn't demonstrate that faith. He was sneaking around in the darkness. Now remember, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He approached Jesus with belief and doubt, with fear and with a lack of understanding. He talked with Jesus, and poor Nicodemus, he just doesn't get it. How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into a mother's womb? How can these things be? In contrast to this story, the next story of someone approaching Jesus in John's Gospel is an unnamed woman who comes to Jesus and then goes and tells everybody in her town to come and see this man who knew everything about her. She was a Samaritan and a woman. But what does any of this have to do with us? 
One of my seminary professors, Amy Pow, says, when it comes to understanding matters of faith, we're all out of our league. Which, you know, makes us kind of like Nicodemus. Approaching Jesus in the dark. Not understanding what he says. Fearful of what our friends might say. And face it, we're kind of like those Israelites in the wilderness who whine and complain. We don't get it most of the time. We are out of our league when we stand and face the mysteries of God. Because God is so much bigger than we understand. Even when we gather in worship and we enact our faith, we don't always get it. Think about our service this morning so far. We called ourselves to worship. But that's for us, not for God. God's attention is already turned toward us. We don't have to say, hey, God, pay attention. We're going to worship now. We need to remind ourselves that we are focusing on something bigger than our own understanding. And then we moved on to our confession. We do this every week because we know that we all sin and fall short of what God would have us be. We're pretty good at confessing our sins because we know when we've goofed up. But then we're reminded that through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. And we don't get it. We have someone pour the water Someone, usually myself, reminds us of the grace of God. And we sit there and we think, oh, well, that's really nice. I know you're talking to the person next to me. Oh, you're talking about that person on the other side of the sanctuary. They're such a good person. That forgiveness is for them. Somehow we fail to make that connection that God's grace is for us for you sitting where you are in your shoes. But we don't get it because the grace of God is so big. We can't quite wrap our minds around it. And then in a little while, we'll share communion. And we'll hear how this is God's table set for us and we are invited guests. We'll remember that when we approach this table, we are fed spiritually, even as the bread and the juice feed our bodies. We remember that Jesus shared this same meal with his disciples, and we don't understand. It's a mystery of God's love and presence, and we don't get it. We are just like Nicodemus, and just like those wandering Israelites. Now, the story about Nicodemus doesn't really do him any favors. He's got a bad reputation for not understanding. But he shows up again in John's Gospel. He shows up and speaks out for Jesus to get a fair hearing before a judgment is passed. And then he shows up again later with Joseph of Arimathea, to take care of Jesus' body after it's taken down from the cross. Nicodemus approached Jesus in the dark, but he didn't stay in the dark. He began as slow and clueless, but his heart changed. He wasn't 100% good guy, and he's not 100% bad guy. Nicodemus is human just like us. And the same is true for the Israelites. And for us, we know what it is to complain to God. We get whiny and frustrated. We don't want to face our shame. But we also know that we can change. 
we can face our fears and our shame and look them in the face and know that God forgives us. We are Nicodemus. We are the Israelites in the wilderness. And we too can have a change of heart and face our shame. Isn't it funny how looking upon the serpent of death is what cures the Israelites? Isn't it funny how leaning on Jesus heals us and changes our hearts and our minds? We goof up. We live in the shadows. We travel in the darkness. But that is where faith begins in the dark, facing death, looking our fear and shame in the face, and then seeing and learning and remembering that death gives way to new life. And our hearts can change. May it be so. Amen.